great. Coming onto the stage, 
everyday people. Very, we have the appearance of, for example, um, uh, non-professional performers, uh, vocabulary and amateurism coming into the theatre. Uh, we have the diversity of languages in my own culture, for example, in the 2000 Cs, a huge amount of indigenous theatre in indigenous language being uh, uh, presented on the stage. And of course, if we go to back-to-back -back theatre, the theatre that works with people perceived to have intellectual disability, we have everyday disabled bodies presented on stage, making not community theatre or theatre of therapy or therapeutic theatre, but remarkable contemporary performance with this very striking vision. So one could say that you know we've had the performative turn with John McKenzie, but maybe we're also at a kind of return, a turn towards the theatre of the real. We're in a kind of moment of real, if you like. Um, theorizing this has been uh, most prominently Carol Martin's work on the real. In fact, she has the book Theatre of the Real, uh, which we've taken our turn from today. Um, she claims this as a, as a, as a, as a, as a naming of a form. Um, uh, but, uh, and she says, the phrase Theatre of the Real identifies a wide range of theatre practices and styles that recycle reality, whether that reality is personal, social, political, or historical. And she also notes the relationship that the real has in performance has to media. So we have this visibility of power through the real, but also an extension of real bodies into media scapes and an extensive use of video technologies to interview subjects, to present subjects in various ways. And then we have, I think, an expansion of theatre, a considerable expansion of theatre into other forms of media as a response. Uh, I'm looking here at uh, the Mapping Journey project, a video installation uh, artwork, uh, which probably many of you have seen by uh, Borja Kadili, who uh, documented journeys, his own journeys, <coughs> as a refugee travels throughout Africa into Europe and the constant ceaseless movement that, that uh, really a form of diarization, of mobility of the refugee, presented as an art project, as a series of maps. Um, we also have the rise of companies like Remini Protocol in Germany, who have produced a series of works around mobility and, and uh, refugees, and also distribution networks. They specialize in making visible networks of power. I remember one of the first performances I saw of that company was a, a, a performance I saw in Germany that featured uh, the workers who work in Turkish rubbish dumps that actually deal with all of Germany's refuse. So this was not a, a performance about refugees or about people, migrants uh, per se. It was actually a performance about invisible things within society. What happens to the rubbish of Europe? It goes to Turkey. And there, a group of workers have to deal with this kind of excessive waste of European society. And it was a piece that actually documented that in very real terms. How much rubbish, what kind, what do you do with it, what happens when you burn it, what's the pollution of that, and so on and so forth. What is the impact on the local society? The third example that I just briefly want to mention is, um, where is this person? She had a rule in the university that only Max exists. Um, is a company that's very dear to me, a company, Japanese company called Port B documentary theatre company that made quite a lot of different projects around the idea of uh, the real or documenting the real. Uh, their most recent one is McDonald's University where uh, they recognise that um, in uh, migration to Europe from Africa and the Middle East, McDonald's restaurants became little stopover points for people to meet up and communicate. One, because they have bathrooms and people can actually use the bathrooms there. Uh, but two, they be, they're very cheap, and so you can actually sit there for uh, a long period of time for, for the cost of a, of a cup of coffee or a, you know, a horrible hamburger. And uh, they decided to set up a, a series of universities in McDonald's restaurants in this migration route into southern Europe, across Greece and out of Turkey, uh, where they had little radio stations micro-broadcasting radio stations, uh, uh, broadcasting interviews with migrants and passing on information about uh, where people could access services and so on and so forth. So it's, a, it's both a documentary theatre piece, it's a theatre of the real piece, but it's also uh, a form of activism and uh, a, a form
form of documentation of the problem. Um, so, to today's panel, we've got the real there, um, uh, three, I think, very interesting speakers who all work with this concept of the real in one way or another, and obviously not in the same way. I'll just very briefly introduce them, the bios are here, uh, and we will run in order of the presentation. The first one is Saha Asaf, who uh, was on the film panel and uh, I've uh, speaking speak several times at the conference. is an actress, stage director, and assistant professor at the American University of Beirut. I won't read the full bio that's in the program, but uh, just to note that Sahar is one of the members of the exchange that has produced this event alongside the Siegel Center and the PhD program in theatre at the American University of Beirut. Um, our other speakers on the panel are Amil. Um, Kauri, a queer and trans mixed race Jordanian documentary playwright and theatre maker based in Munich, uh, author of several plays, and I won't read the plays out because they're in the program. But, uh, uh, and finally, uh, Ruben Melendo, founder and artistic director of Theatre Muti, is a director, writer, and creative technologist whose practice and pedagogical work is situated in the tension between acting and performance, theatrical design and installation. Uh, and uh, multimedia and interactive technology. Uh, he's also a professor at uh, New York University where he teaches in performance and making and the theatre. So, uh, just a very quick welcome to our, our panel. And, uh, <laughs> so, our first speaker is going to be Salma. So, uh, I'll give the stage over to you. Salma. In the absence of developed playwriting tradition, government support, and funding opportunities, and with the presence of prior censorship, theatre makers in Lebanon find themselves using every accessible artistic method that would get the stories they choose to tell to their audiences. This ongoing exploration leads to creating synthesized dramaturgical approaches or using the term of British theatre maker and academic Liz Tomlin, productive cross-pollination. In what follows, I will offer two examples of plays we produced at the Theatre Initiative at AUB that reflect this cross-pollination dramaturgical approaches. The first is Garcia Broca's Blood Wedding, which I directed and Robert Myers produced and also was the dramaturg of that piece, performed in a prominent site-specific style during April 2018 in Hamana village of Mount Lebanon for capacity audiences. The production offers an example of a dramaturgical approach that combines two ostensibly binary positions, text-based classical theater and innov innovative experiments with space. The second example is No Demand, No Supply, a device documentary play that offers a re-reading of Lebanon's 2016 sex trafficking scandal using interviews, police reports, newspaper articles, and sociological study of prostitution, and joins all within the frame of the proscenium. Blood Wedding, the first tragedy of Lorca's rural tr trilogy written in 1932, dramatizes a true story that took place in 1928 Spain in a linear plot of three acts representing themes of feud, repressive social structures, and suppressed bodily desires. The play opens with the bridegroom's mother lamenting her son, her lost son and, uh, and husband in a violent feud with the Felix family as her son, other son, confirms to her his wish to marry the bride, a young woman who was previously engaged to Leonardo Felix. We are then introduced to Leonardo, who is now unhappily married to another woman, has a child and expecting another. The father of the bride and the bridegroom's mother um, seal the deal for the wedding by discussing merging their properties for their descendants' sake. 
Act two begins with a heated conversation between Leonardo and the bride. Sorry. Uh, as she's preparing for her wedding, the couple declare their flaming love for one another and they run away together in the next scene during the wedding ceremony. Leonardo's pregnant wife announces their escape and the mother encourages her son, the groom, to chase, to chase them. The realistic style of Act 1 and 2 is broken by a surreal atmosphere in Act 3, where we are introduced to symbolic characters in a forest. Three woodcutters speak about the scandal, offering three distinct societal responses to the events. The moon appears expressing its thirst for blood, joined by a beggar for telling that the beggar takes the group to his fate under the light of the moon. Meanwhile, the bride and the Leonardo are expressing their endless love and lust for one another. A duel with knives ensues where both men perish. The last scene in the play joins the bride with the mother, both lamenting their fates and their losses. Our own dramatization of the play was a faithful adaptation of Lorca's text in terms of characters and plot, yet we chose a village instead of a proscenium to present it. The audience arrived in, at Hamana Artist's house, and at the beginning of the play, they were divided into two groups by two beggars. I doubled Lorca's beggar, whom we meet in Act 3, and gave them an extra function. The beggars guide the audiences just like they guide other characters in the play. It was as if Lorca's deaf character is taking us into a journey of life. The audiences are first greeted at Hamana Artist House by the two beggars at the beginning of the show and led to the houses of the mother, Leonardo, and the bride, that is to say, houses of the villagers of Hamana. The beggars then take the audiences to the wedding ceremony and on to the following, uh, the, on to following the manhunt at the end of Act Two. The last two scenes of the play took place in an old cinema house named Droxy and a church, respectively. The audience are taken to an old auditorium and asked to sit and watch as the play becomes surreal. In the 60-year-old Roxy cinema, the beggars stop being the guide for a while and join the action on stage to assist the groom in finding Leonardo and the bride. With the sinotrophal Vita Hashishu, we chose one element common to the village and Lorca's forest, the trees, to create a surreal atmosphere in the Roxy. The forest where the men kill each other is flipped upside down. Being in an old movie theater, the love scene between Leonardo and the bride is projected on a large screen reminiscent of the cinema layered with grotesque trees. After they complete their mission, the two beggars guide the audiences to the last scene in a church. Acting followed a realistic approach. The actors were immersed in their characters in tune with the realistic, untouched scenic spaces, except for the rock scene. But despite the realistic acting and the ready-made realistic atmosphere of the village, the dramaturgical approach didn't aim to conceal the theatrical fabrication. What we aimed at is to create a fictional world within the context of the, realist the, the realistic setup of the village. The costumes belong to a different era, the music to various different countries, and most crucially, the Armiye translation of the play presented a familiar yet elevated language observing the spirit of Garcia Lorca's poetic text and likes to use equally lyrical translation to English, which is the translation I used to compose a Lebanese version of the play. The difference between the stage scenes and realistic houses slash settings and the experience of the village in, in between the scenes served as a central dramaturgical juncture. The village, its happenings, and its characters served as another dramatic layer on top of our choreography of Lorca's story. The spectators were constantly invited to switch between two main channels, the plotline of Lorca's play and that of the village, both simultaneously presenting images and actions. It was left up to them to combine both channels in one vision. This prominent difference between the world of the play and that of the village presented the audiences with a complex puzzle. They not only had different perspectives into the scenes and the environment of the village, but they were also constantly aware of the presence of other audience members. It was up to them to create a synthesis of the various pieces, staged and unstaged, presented to them. For instance, as the audience leave the church where the last scene in the play takes place and head back to the artist house, and as they're marching silently, a graveyard appears in their view, which simply happened to be on our way back to the initial meeting point. This ready-made setup generated a powerful effect and gave audiences a 
much needed closure after an intense last scene. Some thought that it was choreographed. The second example I would like to give of synthesized dramaturgies is that of no demand, no supply. Unlike with Blood Wedding, this work started with a personal reaction to factual news and ended up on a proscenium. Early April 2016, like many Lebanese, I woke up to the news of the special operation that the Lebanese security forces did to bust a human trafficking network and save 75 Syrian women imprisoned in two brothels east of Beirut. The news outraged me and made me want to do something about it. In 2017, with the support of the Center of Arts and Humanities at AUB, I decided to put the stories of the women survivors on stage, though I had no idea then about what exactly I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. When the story came out, it gained huge media attention as the women told horrifying stories about the torture and the abuse they suffered at the hands of one of the lead figures of the network, which was making more than $1 million a month, according to the police reports. Few weeks after the uncovering of the story, the media lost interest in it, and slowly it started fading into oblivion. My starting point was the written and video reports of the mainstream media. It struck me that there were no comments about the sex buyers who, fre who frequented these brothels. Despite the fact that the Lebanese law doesn't criminalize the sex buyer, I found it inexcusable that there was no discussion in the mainstream media about the culture that entitles these men to freely purchase sex with no consideration to the situation of the women and no attention to the fact that they were trafficked. This became the focus of the performance and defined its dramaturgy. In the process of texturing the performance, I adapted the following material. The video recorded interviews with refugee women survivors conducted by investigative reporters. The audio recorded interviews I conducted with women survivors, investigative reporters, the colonel who took the decision to raid the brothels, and the expert on sex trafficking and prostitution at CAFA NGO. The indictment issued seven months after the arrest of the ring and CAFA's 2014 sociological study on the demand of prostitution. The resulting texture of the theatre production was that of a performance lecture which I played the narrator and hired actresses to play the roles of the trafficked women. I employed Aleki's Blythe recorded delivery technique to deliver the testimonies of women survivors. In recorded delivery performances, actors on stage listen to live audio recordings through earphones and repeat exactly what they hear so they don't memorize their text. I hired male actors to audio record the words of sex buyers I pulled from CAFA's study. These were played during the show as voiceovers juxtaposed with the testimonies of the women. The staging of No Demand No Supply was minimalistic. The first stage image is a bird stage with a music stand on the left side. As the narrator, I take that music stand. Every time I introduce a woman survivor, an actress would bring a chair and place it on the right side of the proscenium. When I get to the part of the sex buyers, stage managers would bring a chair for each voiceover. At the end of this section, there would be 55 empty chairs mid-stage, fully lit, representing the anonymity of the sex buyers, and 55 because that is the number of the interviews that CAFA's that study could reach in 2011. The last image of the performance is comprised of the narrator on the left, six actors on the right, and 55 empty chairs on center stage. Light dims at on left and right and brightens on center stage before it all black out. In my retelling of the story with the help of the actresses, I was presenting a quasi-news report on the case. However, it differed from all the reports that the mainstream media presented, which were purely sensational, without any social or political observation. The performance achieved its most substantial impact thus far by bringing the demand aspect of prostitution and trafficking for the first time to the attention of the mainstream media. Rima Karaki, host of the National Program for <coughs> TV, one of the major local TV channels, was attending the, the performance at El Medina. After the show, she dedicated a 20-minute segment of her program in 2017 on primetime TV to talk about the demand aspect in sex trafficking. Remarkably, her opening question was, why is this aspect, meaning the demand for prostitution, totally out of our attention as audiences? Why did I have to wait to watch the play to comprehend that the buyer is a criminal somehow? To close, in these two examples I provide, the cross-pollinational dramaturgical approach puts the spectator in a state of an encounter with the text or the performance. 
rather than watching blood wedding through a virtual fourth wall in the safety of the proscenium, spectators were forced to physically move to encounter one scene after another, synthesizing the text with the production and the village as they go from one ultra-realistic location to another. Despite the stylization we maintain through various theatrical elements for many audience members who didn't know the play before and aren't familiar with Lorca's works, the play was written for Hamana village today and not for Spain, 1930. No Demand, on the other hand, negotiated through a theater building a social event back into public memory. Although audiences watched the performance while comfortably seated in the auditorium of the proscenium, they were addressed directly to connect the theater event with their social and political world. Both performances, although their cross-pollination dramaturgical approaches, challenged their audiences into an experience rather than restrained them into a receptive role and by that offered two different forms of theater of the real. The real being left to the audiences to present. <coughs> Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll take questions at the end of the three papers, I think, so that we've got uh, time, we can sort of create a conversation between the papers, but um, just uh, some very interesting insights there. Um, our second speaker is going to, I think you're next, are you? Oh, okay. So we're, we're running in order of the program, if you're following here, so it's... Uh, What's the dramaturgy behind my work? And this is something that I do a lot in, with plays. That's easy for me. And then I had to turn it on my own life, and that was oof, quite a challenge. Um, so that this is the question that's uh, driving the presentation today. And so I had to start, unfortunately, from the very, very beginning. And um, and it, it starts with my, with my parents. I'm a mixed race person. I don't know if anybody in here is mixed race. Nobody. Yes. Okay, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Being mixed race is, is um, especially if you're a white passing person of color, it's like I walked into a supermarket yesterday in New York and he's, he's an Egyptian guy starting to speak to him in Arabic and he was saying, oh, your Arabic is so good. Or, and I get that constantly. I'm constantly not being recognized and in Germany they call me oh you're a refugee even though my mother is German and I have a German passport there's no way I'll ever be German and there's no way I'll ever be Jordanian so it starts with a kind of impossibility that uh, maybe you know mixed race people can understand and this seems to be impossibility seem to me the best way to describe the work that I'm doing or the, the thing that's um, driving my work those are my parents and behind them is the village of my dad uh, when, when I was very young, I think in first grade, I wrote on a piece of paper, they asked us what you want to be when, when you grow up, and I wrote, I want to be an artist or an actor. And this, this was already an impossibility because I was living in Saudi Arabia. I don't know how I said I wanted to be an actor. There was nothing to be refuted in Saudi Arabia. There was, this is what it looked like. This is a dissemination plan. That's what I knew was like the sea and the sand and dissemination plans. There was, it was a little bit theatrical. I mean, there was, you know, like markets and the fish market especially was quite theatrical and so I can see where I, I, I got some of that from but I honestly don't know how the acting part came in. 
And then the, the principal came in to visit our class and she saw my paper and she, she, uh, she said, but you can't be an actor, you're a girl, you have to be an actress. So she asked me to cross it out and to, to write actress. And the problem is that uh, it wasn't possible for me to be, you know, one, one gender either. I mean, you know, that's a, another impossibility, the impossibility of being one gender. I'm a trans person and so there was another impossibility right there on that paper at age six. And so um, I'm, I've changed it back kind of now. Um, this is um, a, another layer of impossibility that I find in theater is theater itself. Uh, when I was a child, I used to um, imitate, the, this is my father's village in the 1950s. There was a woman, and she used to get her mail from her son who lived in the US. And the, it, the, the mail was brought by a guy on a donkey, and he gave her the letters from her son. And she would come to my father's house, because he was literate, to read the, the letters. And, and when she was gone, I began to imitate her. And then it became a thing where my father would say, I'll give you ten piastres if you can imitate this woman. And, and that's how I started like making money from theater. <laughs> It's all I've ever made. But I think theater itself is also, there's something inherently impossible about theater. And this is a question I'm asking a lot of people who do theater. Is like, am I the only one who sees theater as, as impossibility right there when somebody who's gone, who's gone home, is appearing again in this same time, in a different time and space? Uh, this, is, this is my father and I, and um, uh, you know, I come from a very conservative Jordanian background, and so there was the impossibility of actually studying theater. <coughs> this is me <laughs> asking my dad if I can study theater. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. So I wasn't allowed to study theater at all, and that was one more impossibility. Uh, and, and like I said, like I'm now asking myself, is it is it is impossibility? And I want to talk to you guys about this uh, during the break. If you are sharing a similar feeling about impossibility as a necessary condition for theater to happen, um, and then I became attracted to impossibility on every level, like outside of the theater as well. It just became the thing that that I was drawn to, or that I could do, or that I could understand, just um, physically as well. Uh, I went to Sarajevo many years ago, and um, I w I, we passed by the graveyard, and I, I looked at the gravestones, and these, all of the people in the graveyard were under 30 years old. So these are the kinds of things that I began to, to feel on a deeply visceral level, just by...
<laughs> and third speaker. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Ruben Orendo, who I think has a connection to the previous speaker's project, so that's a good uh, connection. But, um, also talking about his own project. So as time gets going, I'm going to get faster, so feel free to just raise your hand and let me know that you're hearing words but understanding nothing. So feel free to say that. Um, so uh, my company is Theatre Me Too, and I want to tell you a little bit about Theatre Me Too uh, uh, and uh, our mission. So Theatre Me Too is a permanent group of trans-global interdisciplinary collaborators. The company's been together for over 20 years, and we are not a contractor company. We don't bring or audition actors or designers. We've worked together for now over two decades. The company is committed to expanding the definition of theater through methodical experimentation with its form. What that means is the company is really looking at pushing some of the boundaries that we ourselves as theater artists establish in both uh, practice and performance and in process. The company researches global performance and collaboration as a source for our training, our work, and our methodologies. This is something the company has been committed to from its beginning. I grew up on the border of Mexico and, and the US, and so my entire experience not unlike what Omo was mentioning, is that of a borderlander. And so that space of actually transmission, reception, and communication between borders has always been inherent to me as an individual and has been in the DNA of the company in ways that have impacted its own practice. The company is driven by a term we call whole theater. And I'm going to drop these kind of terms over the short presentation. My hope is perhaps to unpack them if they are of interest as we travel through the conversation. Um, I want to talk about Theatre Meech's dramaturgy, and again, I'm going through this fast just to give us a bit of context. Theatre Meech's dramaturgy is really focused on looking at what we call the architecture of performance or the structure of our performative work. We further really, really obsess about what the proposed impact. In other words, we move away from a kind of narrative stance into a much more porous and a much more non-narrative ideology of how we make work and really invite a conversation around that and really the proposed impact. One of the best ways, I, I had a conversation with a parent of one of my company members, uh, and she gave me the best answer to what Theater Meech's dramaturgy was. She said, it feels like you're sitting around a big dinner table, and everybody's talking and sharing and connecting and linking, and it feels like at the end you feel like you talked about 20 things, but really you were talking about one thing. And that to me was really moving because it cited me back to my own upbringing and realized that that's exactly how conversations happen in, in Mexican tables. And we'll connect, connect that to the Arab world in a moment because when I first traveled there, I literally felt like, why do I understand this dynamic so inherently? Uh, why do I understand the ability to link and travel and engage in this kind of tributary conversation that is really traveling through rivers and back to the main one and so forth in a way that was fluid, seamless, and impactful? Modes of storytelling and story making. For us as a company, we've really relegated the idea of us as storytellers and really invite the audience to become story makers. I say that because, again, our dramaturgy infers a whole host of conversations, images, and voices. And the invitation is really an engaged one on the part of the audience. The performativity of collaborative tensions. For us as a company, as a collaborative team, there's a way I always say this to students that we often, of course, confuse collaboration and democracy. And the idea being that collaboration is actually about the tensions as much as about the harmonies. And as a company, it's not about agreement, but it's about how do we give life and performativity to the tensions and disagreements that we engender and engage with as a company. Technology and the idea of prosthetic memory. As a company, we've been committed for over two decades to investigating the 
frameworks and conversations around technology, not as a backdrop, but as a collaborative force in the work. We have really established a practice of engaging technology as a, a way of creating what we term prosthetic memory. It's the idea of really accessing a link to our memories and in many ways creating a shared memory space. And I'll link to that a little bit in a moment. The actor as transmitter, and this will come to bear in the conversation around theater of the real. As a company, we've really moved away from the idea of the actor as an embodier or someone who really inhabits character. For us, we've really taken on the actor as a transmitter of information, as a transmitter of emotion, and it's someone who actually sits as part of the connective fiber. And the idea of interdisciplinarity, part of our agenda and mission is certainly to push the boundaries of theater practice and theater performance. And for us, something that's become very clear is that we often, as theater makers, don't look into the remarkable practice and processes of artists in other fields. There's, as we know, much to learn from those practices and really fuel our conversations. So the work of Theater Me Too takes on a very visual shape. It is a very physical form, and again, you'll see shapes of interaction. Our source material ranges as we engage in the work and takes a, a, a different shape, really, as we uh, develop the work. The work takes over three years to develop uh, uh, and then really begins its, its trajectory and performance, which is also a development space for us. Uh, we actually just closed a, a show here in Brooklyn in our new space. We opened the new space. We have a space. We, I invite you all to a space. It's our space. I say that very. It's a, 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 a huge warehouse in the Gowanus area of Brooklyn. Uh, uh, the space is called Me Too 580. We premiered it with our piece, which you're seeing images of now remnant. Uh, and we hope for that to become a space of incubation and conversation, not unlike these. Uh, so the, the, the work with the company uh, uh, continues and, of course, develops. But I want to really sit in one particular project that is relevant to our conversation. So I'll give a little, a little backdrop uh, for, for a moment in terms of context. <coughs> So as I mentioned, I'm from uh, the border of Mexico in the U.S., from a city called Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. This is a map of where it is. You see it there on the top. Uh, uh, and it really is a, a, a remarkable area. And if you know anything about geography, it happens to be where the, the river that separates Mexico and the U.S. is as thinnest, uh, the Rio Grande. And so it becomes a massive passageway, and historically have been, has been a massive passageway. Throughout its early life, and certainly into the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, Ciudad Juarez was this incredibly idyllic landscape. It was seen as a seat of innovation, it was seen as a seat of communication with the U.S., and really as a seat of really uh, elegant conversations around culture, around architecture, uh, and this is the city that I grew up in. Uh, there was, however, a huge influx of changes and histories that took place, many of them dealing with economic changes, governmental changes, and ultimately moves that affected the trafficking of drugs. So that, that particular portal, because of that ease of crossing, became the main vein through which drugs entered North America. This became an incredible burden on the city and ultimately became an incredibly destructive force. So the images that you see now are actually images of the city that I remember. I left to college when I was 18, came to the United States, started my trajectory, and I saw the city change and develop from a distance. So much so that by the time that I uh, uh, returned to the city, it looks like this. This is a drastic change. The city takes on a whole other life and really becomes in many ways, uh, uh, destroyed by this trafficking of drugs, the corruption that attaches to it, and a whole host of, of navigations. So much so that the amount of murders and crimes that happen in the city top not only any city in Mexico, Latin America, but in the world. So much so, and just as a little a side note, the images that you're seeing of a, of a murder crime are in front of my mother's house. We're literally waking up to that. Um, uh, so much so that by 2009, Ciudad Juarez, this small city, is titled Murder Capital of the World. It is averaging between 90 to 120 murders a week. I am hearing reports from my family while I am in my own educational arc, and you are seeing decapitations, you are seeing uh, hanging bodies. This has become the trajectory, and the city becomes incomprehensible to me. Of course, there's great concern, but again, for me, it becomes about understanding this wax and wane of the identity of a city. As I proceeded in my own practice and with my company, one of the spaces to bring ideas of confusion and understanding has really been that company collaboration. And so to my company, I brought this conversation about Juarez and my attempt to understand it. Because in many ways, I have become a foreigner to it. There's a great difference from being and having grown up somewhere to living there every day. A great difference from calling from New York concern while waking up in that landscape. 
And so to me, that kind of order of the lender relationship became a space of confusion. And so with my company, we really uh, uh, started exploring what would that conversation be like of trying to understand this, and is there a role for the artist to play in this conversation? And so we started to really look at how would we explore this. We did a site visit to what is to engage with artists there and start a conversation as to what role the arts could play. And what was most astounding to us was that the conversation in Juarez was not about the violence and about the horrors, but it was actually about the remarkable change that citizens of that city are enacting in that landscape. That in fact, the journalistic headlines were 200 killed, 300 murdered, narco-trafficking, all of these conversations, but nobody was telling the story of the work that was happening, of the belief in that city. And so we as a company felt that there was a work to do in collaboration with artists there, and that, that work was actually to, yes, acknowledge the complication of the situation, but to celebrate and honor the spirit of the people there and the work that was happening and their belief in a city and in a, and in a culture that really had a history much richer than this past. We started looking at modes of engaging in this and looked at, of course, documentary theater practices. I had the great privilege of sitting with many colleagues who are steeped in the practices, some of which you've worked you know, Marcus Kaufman, Adam Year Smith, KJ Sanchez, Steve Costin, and really sat in conversation with them about their practices, about their methodologies, about their engagement, right? But there was a little bit of a dissonance in that space because so much of their work is about embodying those narratives. And again, for us, one of the premises is the actor as transmitter. Furthermore, my company, though global and international in both stands and in terms of bodies on stage, is not a Mexican company. I am the sole Mexican member of that company, and so embodying Mexican voices became deeply problematic to me. And so how could we really hone into this idea of transmitting the work that we were witnessing and the conversations we were witnessing? And so we turn, as was mentioned earlier, to a conversation about theater of the real as a larger framework, taking literally a page of dear colleague, Karen Martin, theater of the real, of Ramini Protocol's work, and also in conversations with Hilton Alls and his whole theories of spectatorship and how the spectator engages in an event. And I was happy to hear the word paradox in relation to the real, because the minute you intone that, there's a whole conversation around that as its own invention in many ways. And so our work started. We spent the next three years in Ciudad Juarez, going back and forth, spending about every other month there interviewing the citizens of Juarez. We interviewed every single person who would speak to us. We spoke to mothers, to politicians, to artists. We spoke to people who had been incarcerated. We, we spoke to, to literally uh, wrestlers. We went to an amazing wrestling match and interviewed all the wrestlers. Because the entire grammar in Lucha Libre is on the performance of violence. And how does that thrive and what does that serve? We continued to engage in all of the voices again that were in dialogue and that were impacted. And again, what we kept finding was this incredible spirit, this incredible sense of leadership, and this incredible sense of hope. And that really gave drive to the work that we would make, which is a piece that we titled, Why Does a Documentary Mythology? And this is the piece that we uh, uh, gave shape and in fact made a commitment to premiere in Juarez. And so we took the piece after working it for three years and premiered it first and foremost to the audiences in the community that had been part of building it and in fact asked for their approval and their golden seal so that we could take this story further. That's one of the most intense things we've ever done. I say when people are like, the New York Times is coming, we're like, now we're like, that's easy. <laughs> when you have 500 people who've trusted you with their voices, with their experience, and they're sitting there witnessing, I've never seen my company so her back. When the piece ended in Juarez, literally the audience rushed with an embrace, with a gratitude, saying, please, please, please tell my story. And my father, who was one of the people who we interviewed, said the most amazing thing about the piece, and he said, in many ways, this story is the story of every city abused by progress. Now, my father's a mechanic, and I only say that because he claims again and again that he's not an artist, but I'm gonna tell you, he's an artist. He's a remarkable artist, and that's why I actually sought out to model as an artist, something known to him. Um, but I say that because that statement became such an elegant mode of engaging the conversation beyond wise, that in fact, there was a conversation to be had in different parts of the world. And so the piece itself, which took on, as with our pieces, a very physical, a very engaged space of technology, uh, uh, really uh, uh, began to take shape and began its tour, first nationally, uh, and then uh, began its international tour as we explored the piece in different spaces. Now, what was most interesting to us was definitely that the conversation shifted and expanded uh, and engaged audiences in different ways. It's also worth noting that the piece was accompanied by a whole host of visual art installations that we generated as a company that was another mode of expressing this. We had too many stories to tell, too many things to say, too many images to share for just one mode of transmission. 
And so this brings us to the, the, the key link to this, which is part of our tour was through the Arab-speaking world. We went to the Levant, uh, to uh, North Africa, and to the Gulf. Uh, we had remarkable, remarkable partners, and this was a further stunning space of connectivity for me. Uh, the first was we spent time in Beirut and mentioned Mlad, uh, and had a remarkable reception. Uh, we had some great partners, one which you see is right here, uh, uh, Linabia, uh, uh, Malhori, uh, Mainzabib, and Sukkot, which you cannot have a conversation about what's happening in this in this work without that. And a remarkable visual artist, Zainal Khalil. Now, it's interesting because Zainal becomes an interesting link as many visual artists engage with the work in really meaningful ways to us. What was astounding to me about the experience there is, I, is that it, did, it was received in that dinner conversation mode. And with that in mind, it really opened up beyond the performance. One of the things that was most astounding to see in that era landscape is that the drama tragic was received and continued beyond the end of the performance. We literally would sit after the performance for three to four hours with audiences there and had to kick them out because in many ways the dinner conversation continued. Um, the piece then traveled uh, to the NYU OWW Arts Center, and again we worked with a whole host of visual artists, namely Sarah Al Khbabi, a remarkable young visual artist, uh, uh, who's really exploring the idea of Emirati perceptions and how those stories are unfolded. Uh, we engaged with a, a series of organizations there and with a whole host of uh, regional artists. Uh, we were then able to travel the piece to the Cairo International Festival for Contemporary and Experimental Theater and had an amazing amount of support from our colleague Dina Ami, who really supported the work in a meaningful way, not only in presenting it, but in the context. And finally, to wrap up, I just want to mention three bullet points that became really key in sharing this work in that part of the world. The first was this continuing dialogue about communities abused by progress. The piece pivoted in a radical way what is presented in Gulf nations. This continuous dialogue of progress without the consideration that progress, though a benevolent force, can also cause a great amount of damage. That it can destroy families, pathways of operation in the community, and actually destroy culture. And the idea that a community halfway across the world will witness this work and find this incredible connective thread was truly, truly meaningful. The idea of the personal history of borders. As we travel, particularly in places like Beirut, there was this hyper-awareness, of course, of the conversation around borders. And truly, the fact that these histories, as they've changed in one generation, have changed the life and the day-to-day -day of communities. In the same way that at the border I grew up in, people used to cross to go get bread from one side of the border to the other. And as colleagues and friends and audiences shared that travel in, in, from Beirut into other parts that were nearby, and that it used to be a fluid space, and for it to become so politicized and charged and injured, that it changes and affects our culture's framework and those relationships. And the, the last is the idea of identity and violence. Perhaps one of the most salient comments that we received as we engaged this mode of dramaturgy in the Arab world was a remarkable comment that came from an audience member after one of our performances in Beirut. She turned to me and she came to me and said, you know, I don't see a lot of theater, and this was very exciting, and uh, you know, I thought, great, 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 this is the thank you, and so forth. And she grabbed my arm, and she said, there's this thing we say in the Arab world, which is somehow we've made ourselves believe that to be Arab is to be inherently violent and inherently corrupt. And she said, and watching this and seeing somebody in a community halfway across the world wrestle with this makes me realize that there's nothing inherently violent or corrupt about being Arab, but it is a situation with histories and layers and political and economic priorities. And so I feel this kind of liberation because I feel like we can actually change and impact history. That night I picked up the phone and spoke to my father and shared this, and he shared the same reflection. He said, in Mexico, we have a narrative that to be Mexican is to be corrupt, is to somehow inherit violence. And in many ways, one of the awakenings of this kind of conversational dramaturgy is to reawaken those histories and to claim a kind of individual identity both for communities and for culture. And so to us, it really reawakened the narrative of the piece and of the journey. Quite as a documentary mythology, continues to tour and to uh, 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 travel through the world, and it itself continues to reveal uh, itself to us, which has been a really, really meaningful space. I'm incredibly grateful to all of the colleagues 
I mentioned him all, but there's a remarkable colleague who literally felt like there is something about this that we even don't understand that is meaningful in this conversation. And to see that really bring itself to life, I think to us was a great testament and a great kind of boost of confidence to the dramaturgical framework that we're engaging. So it's no longer simply about kind of experimentation, but it's actually about a kind of democratizing of the experience of watching theater. Um, I'll stop there. So thank you so much. Very much. Thank you. Uh, three really excellent presentations. <coughs> Can I ask the panelists to come back up, and we'll take uh, 15 minutes for questions. <coughs> uh, just to reflect on perhaps um, three three points that really seem to resonate from the presentations. And the first one is the problem of the real. In, in creating the real, we also create the problem of the real, and, and reality becomes a problem. Of the real, so, uh, possibly we could extend that into the impossibility of the real. That was such a wonderful meditation on the idea of possibility and, uh, and what my dear colleague in, in the Balkans calls misperformance. Um, and, and thirdly, um, the idea of the prosthetic memory and, and the potential for dramaturgy to remake history, I think, uh, very much resonated across all of the presentations there. So um, they're just three suggestions that we might begin the conversation with, but we'll look to the, to the people on the floor for questions. Um, Please use the microphone, and uh, if you could keep your question brief, because we have 15 minutes, and we want to get through as many as we can. Thank you. Any starters? Makes it about that kind of thing. It's fascinating. That's the wonderful, beautiful paradox. 
And would other people like to comment on the question of cultural economy or capitalism more broadly? Because I think there's a remarkable way that the three presentations do address theories of globalization or experiences of globalization more broadly, but also this uh, a very problematic relationship or binary, if you like, of the so called East West binary and, and the way in which the, the West and the rest, or the, you know, I like to think about the, 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 you know, the former West as a, as a kind of way of disorienting our perspective. <coughs> uh, and the way that the, the East extends into this, this dialogue about violence, hysteria, failure, uh, failed histories, so on and so forth. And it becomes, you know, it, it becomes misrepresented in those terms. Well, each of your pieces really do interrogate that, that very stereotypic and problematic depiction of, of vast geographical territories so, yeah, that, have, that have been you know, essentially cut off from the idea of the West as the success. <laughs> okay, we'll take the next question. Yep. I was, uh, we saw the pictures of the God wedding and we saw audiences there. And uh, I was just wondering, uh, you know, we are talking a lot about what we do, but I was wondering how do you, how do you relate to your audiences? How do you get your audience? Who is your audience? Uh, what is the general sort of relationship with the audience as you, as you are doing your uh, projects? And that's for everybody, really. Right. Um. You know, at the theater initiative of um, at the American University of Beirut, what we tried to do since day one when Robert and I started working together in 2013 is to really move theater outside the campus. So our main audience are not the A is not the AV community to begin with. But in general, there's the there's this idea that we have in Lebanon that people who go uh, you know see theater are the familiar strangers. These are the same people that we see over and over and over again. And we're talking about a very small country, we're like maybe four or five million, we don't have a sense of it for a long time. But um, in general, it's a very select group of people that go see th this kind of theater. I would say like 5,000. This is the figure that we put in, like three to 5,000 is the figure that we put in in our budget estimate, you know, in terms of how much money we can you know, bring back in the box office. But it, when you're doing work like this, there's no money in the box office. Yeah, yeah, I was talking about people because you have to, you know, estimate how many people are going to come and see the play, you know. But when 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 you're doing like social, you know, comedies, uh, um, they, they said, like, they, they said <coughs> for a long period of time, like, they can play for up to six months. But, uh, you know, it's really, it's really, uh, I, I, I don't want to make generalization about the audience, but I think it's very diverse, you know, like the people who go see theater. I mean, you experience theater and you present it, can you? Yeah, I'm really curious though about, because I, I left Beirut um, two years ago, almost three now, and I'm just curious, I didn't get to see Blood Wedding, but I'm, I'm very, I think it's a fantastic idea to put Lorca in a, in a Lebanese village, I think there's, it transposes so easy. I'm just wondering what, what the audience reactions were up there. Like, did they relate to this play as I predicted they would? The, what we heard, we didn't do a study on the audience of Blood Buddy, but what, what we heard like verbally through personal feedback to me, to Robert, to the students, to the actors working on the play, like many, I, I had two people come to me and say, so, because they didn't know Lorca, they thought this is a play written for Hamena. <laughs> You know, so, it, it, and people were really engaged, you know. They loved the experience of, you know, walking in the village. Some people, it was the first time in the village. Some people knew the village before, but they saw it from a different perspective. Some people were curious about why I kept the name Leonardo, for instance, because, you know, you would never hear that name in Lebanon. Um, you know, we, we got all kinds of feedback, but it was, you know, we, we sold out, really, in the first day. It was a very limited uh, capacity for audiences. That was one of the reasons, but also because it really was a new experience. It was offering people, a uh, theatre goer, and, you know, something different to experience. But I'm just wondering, like, about the question of, like, were you able, you want to reach out, and you say you <coughs> want to take it out of the box of AUP. Did you feel like this was, like, was it, I don't want to use the word success, but how, like, I want to 
course, I would say yes. I would say we have been succeeding throughout the work that we've been doing to really take theatre outside of AUB. Like, you know, if you look at the history of theatre at AUB and how the other theatre practitioners in the country and theatre critics used to reflect on it, and you look at how now they're reflecting on it, we're not framed as a university theatre, you know. Even when people review their, your play, they're not referring to it as a university theatre, although it is produced thanks to the institution, you know. So it reaches out, but again, it's always limited the, the number of people who are interested to begin with. And we don't have a theatre culture, we don't teach theatre at schools, you know, people don't know where the theatres are, you know, I teach you know, university students at AUB who come from, you know, um, well-established economic backgrounds, you know, uh, and you would expect that these people have been exposed at the schools they went to are very good private schools that you would expect to take people to, to theatres, and this this is something that happens all the time. If I want to take them, if I want to give them directions to go to Medina, I will have to say it's next to Dunkin' Donuts, you know, so they don't know. <laughs> so the question here? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you all three, I love those presentations. Um, Amina, there was one thing that I found very interesting and it, it just kept me thinking was language. Which language do you use? I mean, being in that position of impossibility and imagining growing up between two languages, meaning mixing languages probably quite dominantly too, how does that translate that impossibility and that makes transitioning hybridity that we spoke about into your performance texts? Well, uh, it's not possible for me to do the, the play in an Arab country in Arabic, so that rules it out. When we did the reading at the country at Munich, we did it in Arabic, and I, want, I insisted on doing this because even though I can never get my plays produced back home, it, I want, it was a political thing for me to put on a trans play in Arabic. And we had German subtitles and, and actually the audience stayed through the whole time and they were reading the subtitles and they were laughing at the jokes and they were... It, it completely... it worked even though I was a bit worried, but... I think now it's going to be done in German, in, uh, in Vienna, German with a bit of English. So um, it's it's tough. You have to, you know. Prog Angela Davis says freedom is a struggle, and so you. I just like, even though, for example, now the director of Vienna is going to be a cis white man. It's like he's not the one who tells me that if we bring people of color, they have to be talented. At least, you know, every it's a you know, it's a step by step thing. So I'm, I'm. Just um, see, seeing it in a bigger context and, and, and accepting the little victories that I can have in that sense. Take one final question. Yeah, I would like to uh, ask about, because uh, I, have, I, I follow this presentation, I really, uh, I am so happy that I am here and could uh, hear all this. I had the question about, uh, you, you start, I, both of you, starting from your own uh, questions and concern, and that makes sense to uh, share it. Like, it's, uh, you can uh, perform it out in other countries, other places, and there is a kind of sharing concern about it. But I, I will come back to Lorca, because it's really questioning me about, uh, I, I do not know the university. I have been in contact with the scene and with artists in Beirut, but I don't know how it's functioned. My question is how your student, uh, is, the, is there a space for them to uh, be able to propose their own concern, uh, starting from their own stories? And if they are like privileged people and econ economically comfortable, how can you get others within this university, within your environment, to have a kind of uh, other concern that can contaminate uh, the university also. Thank you, this is a very good question, but to begin with, I have to say that we don't have a major in theatre, we don't teach students to become theatre makers or actors, or we've been successful in the sense that many students who come from business or engineering or architecture background, many different backgrounds actually 
went on and uh, you know to a master's degree in theater, drama therapy, uh, cultural production, different you know fields. But we don't have a major, so that is number one. Number two, we don't have a space. We don't have infrastructure. So Robert and I would hold rehearsals in classrooms on campus, different, but not a proper you know. That's why we don't perform really on campus because our in, in, intention was to you know we use this production class to create. It, it really fed to what we call later the theater initiative, and it became the you know the the hub at the university that is producing this professional theater. It starts with the with an idea. We bring in the students, you know, to share that idea with us. We bring in professionals to work side by side with the students, and then we take it out to the to the Lebanese theatrical scene. So at this point, I have to. <coughs> In an answer to your question, it really happens within certain classes. Like in uh, in the English department where Robert teaches, we have a playwriting class that students can, you know, write about any topic they want. You know, uh, we have uh, a filmmaking class that they can also produce like short films on various topics. In the directing class that I teach, in the acting class that I teach, these are obviously free for them to. But in the production class in particular, these are projects that we initiate basically and then we bring students on board. But then they have room to work with designers with in areas that they, you know, want to, to work. And, and actually I just saw May here who was in one of uh, those classes and I don't know if you want to share your experience. I don't want to put you on the spot. No, yeah, but yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I took the production class and I took the production um, in 2013, it was for Rituals of Science and Transformations for Saadal Law and Nus. Um, and I think it was the first one, right? It was the first one to, to come up. And it, I was a senior at the time, and it was really, I mean, I was already a little involved in theater, but it was such a lovely way to get your foot in the door in a major production, as Sahar said. It wasn't, it is a university production, but that does not mean it's a, unprofessional production. And I think that sets the standards and I think that was a really lovely way to prove ourselves as well as students that we can also be professional, you know, break this uh, stereotype of it. Um, and I, at the time, as being a student, I was one of the actors as well um, and I assisted with the design. So it's a really nice collaborative way to be exposed. And then I actually, after graduating, I continued working with Sahar as uh, on another production on the rape. Um, so it's a you know it's a nice cycle of how things. In May you were studying what when you took that oh, class? Um, I was studying sociology and anthropology at the time. <coughs> and now you're doing your MA. MA. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing my masters now at CUNY, but the School of Professional Studies in Applied Theater um, on a Fulbright scholarship. And so you know I, I I always try to encourage my friends in the drama club in AUB to try to get into this uh, cycle of things because it's a nice way to expose themselves. Thank you, and thank you very much to our panelists, uh, three very, very great <laughs> So uh, we're breaking now for lunch, and we'll be back at 2.30 for the afternoon sessions. You're welcome to go down to the eighth floor to be in the cafeteria here, or... Uh, uh, so. Just one floor down.